Um, we will call the regular city council meeting for start with the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, we're going to start our meeting off tonight with um, the presentation of some awards. We had to postpone this from uh, last month's meeting due to uh, inclement weather. Uh, and I'm really glad that we did that because I think we have nearly 100% participation and we have our um, HIV AIDS task force here. So this is a commission that has been around. I actually forget the date, but I know Marco and others are going to talk about it. But for many years, they have served Bristol extremely well. And uh, we want to give everybody that has served an all heart award. So I'm going to list the names of those individuals that we're going to recognize. They may all may not all be here, uh, but I'll also ask Marco Pomeri to come up to say a few words. So Tina Tangway, Valerie um, Ingram, Delita Rose Daniels, Patricia Checo, David Ryan, who I don't think is here, Phyllis Del Mastro, Alicia Hamid, Alice Ferguson, Laura Minor, um, uh-oh, I can't read my own writing, Heidi Kelly, and Marge Rivera. I did get it. If you can all come up, we'll, we'll give you an award and uh, let Marco say. I am, I have my camera ready. Good evening, folks. Good evening, Mayor Caggiano, member of the Brist members of the Bristol City Council, members of the public, and of course, our past members of the Mayor's Task Force on HIV, AIDS, and Hep C. My name is Marco Palmieri, and I'm the Director of Health for the Bristol Burlington Health District, or BBHD. I'm here to express my sincere appreciation <clears throat> and recognition for the outstanding work of the task force. The commitment and dedication demonstrated by the members of the task force in addressing the challenges posed by HIV AIDS are truly commendable. Your unwavering support for those affected as well as your advocacy for education, prevention and access to resources has and continues to make a significant difference in the lives of those individuals and families in Bristol. The recent disbandment of the task force is a result and true testament to the successes of the task force, the HIV AIDS community and the public health efforts throughout the world. It is not often that we hear of a task force that meets its mission, but you have, and the community thanks you for it. You all will forever serve as a beacon of hope and empowerment for those affected by HIV AIDS and Hep C, while also raising awareness and fostering understanding within our community. Your tireless efforts in promoting acceptance, inclusion, and support were invaluable and deeply appreciated. Please accept my heartfelt gratitude for your dedication and compassion. The impact of your work extends far beyond words, and I am honored to be here and acknowledge the visual and individual contributions of the mayor's HIV task force. And I truly wanna thank the mayor and the city council 
for recognizing this task force. Um, it means a lot to them, and I can assure you that uh, they will never forget this day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. Laura? I just wanted to say a couple of, oh, it's Laura Minor, Bristol, Connecticut. I was one of the founding members of the task force 32 years ago under Mayor John Leone. Um, and one of the reasons we started was because a man named Leon Burdett passed away in Bristol from AIDS and not one of our funeral homes would bury him except for O'Brien's. And uh, so out of that and the number of people that were getting infected, we created this task force with the support of all the mayors. Um, I just wanted to take a moment. These are also pictures of people who served uh, some of whom have passed on from AIDS. And I just wanted to read the names of all the people I could remember who have served. Mike Chartier, Roxanne Chartier, Pat Malone, Kit Ford, Troy Chartier, John Griffin, Rich Baraglia, Leon Verdette, Barbara Mace, Gail Ide, Gabby Gelinas, Christina Cipriani, Janelle Howard, Darlene Beltramitis, Stella Bentavango, Diane Ashworth, Ken Flight, Carlene Glazer, Mike Euclid, David T.G., Pat Checo, Phyllis Del Mastro, and Nelson Foreman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. And again, a heartfelt thank you from myself uh, and also a reminder, and I know some of you are thinking about or have thought about getting involved with the mayor's uh, task force, uh, opioid task force. Uh, more than welcome. Please reach out to us. And, you know, that's a task force that is growing. And remember that Marco, who also spoke here, uh, stay connected to the Bristol Burlington mm -hmm. Health Department because they're going to carry on a lot of your initiatives as well. So thank you all. Appreciate it. Next on our meeting agenda, it's not listed here, but as part of our opening ceremonies, I had a special request um, from Chief Brian Gould, and I'm going to invite him to the podium to make an announcement. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, beloved community of Bristol. On March 25th, 2024, I will have completed 30 years of service with the Bristol Police Department. My contract expires on April 6th, 2024. And with a very heavy heart, and after much consideration, I've decided not to renew my contract, and therefore I will be retiring when my contract expires. This is something that I've been thinking about and I could not in good faith enter into full contra contractual negotiations knowing that my retirement was near at hand. This decision comes with much difficulty and very mixed emotions. Serving this great community for 30 years and eight plus of those years as your chief of police has been very rewarding. It has truly been an honor to serve and protect this great community and I will never ever be able to express my gratitude for the opportunity to serve with the great men and women, past and present, of the Bristol Police Department. Furthermore, I will never be able to express my gratitude towards the community of Bristol. There are many communities that have taglines, monikers, tenants. Our community has several. We are one, Bristol strong, all heart. Without question, the community of Bristol lives up to these tenants. That was never more apparent in my experience than what we all witnessed after the tragic events that occurred on October 12, 2022. Three of our finest, bravest, and most noble were ambushed in the line of duty. Two of them, the great Lieutenant Dustin DeMonte and the great Sergeant Alex Hamsey, were killed in action and will never come home to their beautiful families. The great officer Alec Ayarato, severely, se se severely injured, forged ahead in battle and stopped the immediate threat to society. From that moment on, this community rallied and demonstrated for all to see that we are one, we are Bristol strong, we are all heart. For that, Bristol, 
I am forever grateful. I will miss serving each and every one of you. I will miss serving with all city personnel. This city is very fortunate to have very wonderful people on their front lines. I have had the privilege of working with a very talented team of department heads and will miss all dearly. To all that are serving on the front lines, I have much respect, deep admiration, and appreciation for what you do. Each and every day, first line personnel leave their families to go to work. They protect and serve others, knowing there's uncertainty and unpredictability. But we know one thing for sure, and that's when danger presents and others flee, our finest, bravest, and most noble will drive to and through that danger with objective of stopping it in its tracks. Day in and day out, these great individuals serve their communities and country selflessly and many times at their own expense. For that, to all, I am forever grateful. Mayor, there are not enough words to express my appreciation for you and your team. Thank you for your leadership and commitment to excellence. I value my time with all of you, past and present, and wish you all the best as you continue to look after the well-being of the great city of Bristol. Finally, to the BPD family, I will never ever be able to express my respect, admiration, and love that I have for you. You are all remarkable, incredibly resilient, and I'm honored to know and serve with each and every one of you. You are the best, and you brought the very best out of me. You've helped me to be complete as a person. You've made me better. If you want to run faster, you have to run with those that are faster than you. And the men and women of the Bristol Police Department are the fastest in the business. The future of the Bristol Police Department is in great hands, and I have no doubt that my retirement will allow this department to grow and experience heights far beyond my own imagination. I have informed the mayor that I will remain available, willing and able to assist in any way I can to ensure a successful transition. Some have asked me why now, is everything okay? And I assure you that everything is excellent. I've been told that you'll know when the time is when it comes. However, I never understood what that meant until now. All I know for me, it's like the calling I had when I made the decision to become a police officer. Some wonderful events have transpired in my personal life that have led my family and I to come to this decision. And I look forward to experiencing new opportunities and new adventures. I started out that this is with a heavy heart and mixed emotions. My heart aches, aches because I love and care for you, all of you. I love what I do. I love the people, community I serve. I love the people, community I serve with. At the same time, my heart is comforted because this has been a great ride and all great rides come to an end. So I will exit this ride with my fists pumping in the air, smiling and laughing and forever bragging about how fortunate I have been to have a front row seat here in the great city of Bristol. From the bottom of my heart, Bristol, I'm forever grateful and I thank you. And at this time, Mayor, I'd like to approach you and request that you sign my retirement papers here. And, and while you come up, um, I would love to give you back your key to the city, by the way. And there's nobody that's earned the key to the city more than you. I also have a commemorative uh, challenge coin for you. This is the 2023 National Law Enforcement memor uh, mem Memorabilia. Um, and I know that's a very special date uh, in May. You, you went down there and... Uh, honored our officers. Uh, Bristol will sorely miss you, but I am very happy, maybe a little emotional tonight, but we're getting through it. I'm very happy for you and your family. So congratulations to you.
Okay. Yeah, she's fine. You sure? <laughs> yes, sir. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our regular agenda. <clears throat> Number two is the approval of the minutes from February 13th, 2024. Motion to approve. Second. Comments, suggestions, changes, anything? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? That motion carries. Uh, we're gonna move on to number three, which is public participation. Um, I don't think we unfortunately don't have anybody on Zoom, but if uh, you signed up, I'll I'll call you up. We are asking that you um, try to stick to a three minute time limit. Uh, and when you do come up, if you can uh, say your name and address for the record, uh, hopefully I can read these. OK, Michelle Allaire. Hello. I'm Michelle Allaire, and I live in two, at uh, 228 Lazy Lane, but in Southington, Connecticut. And I'm here um, because I just recently, um, somebody helped me out greatly. I have been going through a terrible situation for the last year and a half and wasn't aware that it all came down to the Covanta uh, uh, plant and the high frequency noises that are penetrating from it. Um, for the last year and a half, I've had difficulty sleeping and hearing this room, room, room noise. And I did, had no idea where this was coming from. And I asked one neighbor and she didn't hear it, but I could hear it. my guest who came to visit. They were like, oh, I slept terrible last night. You know, you're, if it was winter time, they thought we thought it was the heating system. Summertime, we thought it was my neighbor's pool pump. And it was just, it's just been unbelievably terrible. This summer was, un, we had uh, central air conditioning put in. And so we no longer have window air conditioning. And if this summer was just horrendous for me, um, I could not fall asleep at all. And um, just about two weeks ago, somebody asked me in our neighborhood, we were chit-chatting, and they said, do you hear that noise? And I said, yes, I do, I do. Oh, my God, do you hear it too? Because at nighttime, I even got in my pajamas, jumped, and I came downstairs, and I said, where are you going? I said, I got to go find out where that noise is coming from. And I had to jump in my car and drove around just trying to figure out where that humming noise was coming from. And um, somebody brought it to my attention that, it appears that they may have found the source of where it was coming from. Um, I did contact um, uh, the director of health, Marco Palmieri, and he was very kind and got back to me uh, the very next day and said that they were looking into it. It's a complex issue and they're hoping to resolve the issue shortly. Um, and he did call it a phenomenon, but I wouldn't call it a phenomenon because it's real. And if you have to go through this, it's a total nightmare. It's like a torture. It's like dripping water on your head every night. I have uh, earplugs don't work. Uh, it, it even kind of penetrates through like the mattress to a certain extent. I've had my ears on the wall trying to figure out where the noise was coming from. I mean, I look up a freak in the neighborhood just trying to figure out walking around. People said, what, what is she doing? I had my house to my ear to our house, um, driving around the neighborhood, just pulling over with the window down, listening. Nope, not here. Pull up a little more. Um, if you could really assist in any way, I would greatly appreciate it because um I'm I'm not fully aware of where things stand right now. Michelle, I'm I'm going to kind of interrupt you because we have a couple other people that I think yeah. want to speak okay. on the same right. topic. 
But I also have some good news for you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Marco Palmieri is here. And I saw that we had some of these public comments signed up. So I'm actually going to ask him to speak a little bit after. So if you don't mind ending your comments here, we'll have a couple others. I want to just say I thank you very much for your time. And if you could assist us, we'd appreciate it. And my guest as well when they visit. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Up next is Ellen Slipsky. Members, I was here back uh, in January. I don't know if you remember me, but yep, eighty, eighty. Uh, Elkhorn Drive. Yep, back. just for the record and something. Got it. Thank yeah, you. I, just wanted, I have some questions um, because I know that you've been working on it, but it seems like it's a never-ending project with no timeline. And this is a, a, a mental health and quality of life issue for everybody, and I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that, and you're sick of hearing from us. But it's important as a Southington taxpayer, I shouldn't have to listen to a plant that isn't, you know, out of our zone. It's and the noise is coming out of their inter enterprise zone. So something should be done about it. Um, there was a report that came out, which was a one pager. Summer. I would like to know about the full report because they must be hiding something. I'd like to know a couple things. I'd like to know if the testing was done by a certified ANSI person or ISO. They talked about the, the testing was done, but at the, it has to be certified to be able to give you the proper decibels. Now, um, another thing, uh, why can't we have a timeline for Coventa? And if they don't meet that, make them cease and desist what they're doing and give them, you know, they have no incentive to fix it. If you give them some alternatives or give them fines, I don't know if the state can get involved, but that's a plant that's like 30, almost 36 years old. So it, I understand that um, they put new equipment in. Did they do the proper testing? Did they get the proper equipment? Did they test it? Do they, I mean, they say they monitor it, but they monitor themselves. So. You know, I don't know if the state monitors them once a year or what. Um, I also want to know, I understand there's a permit that they want to do medical waste. Is there a permit that has been given to the DEP? They've submitted a permit to the DEP. The DEP has taken no action. Okay. I mean, why didn't, are they not taking any action? I mean, they are, is it outstanding for approval? Uh, it is outstanding for approval. That was submitted three and a half, maybe four years ago. And uh the DEP hasn't issued many permits at all for that type of thing. So that is something that nobody's heard anything about, but you'd have to address the, the state on that. Okay, the state. I'd like to so, know who the contact person is, because yep. I'll be glad to call them. And you can contact the mayor's office and we can connect you to DEEP. All right, I'll contact them. Um, so I, I do want to mention that we, we as residents Plainville, Southington, Wolcott, and Bristol, mainly the Bristol uh, residents. I feel sorry for them. We shouldn't have to take sleep aids. We shouldn't have to buy noise. We shouldn't have to sleep in a different room than my husband, or we shouldn't have to move. And it's really bad. If I don't know where you guys live, but and hear it or not, but it's not fair to us. I mean, I know. Um, I mean, to me, if you if you didn't pay your taxes, you'd be after the residents. So we're looking for you to go after them and do something about it as quickly as possible with a timeline. Otherwise, I may even go out call the attorney general at this point because I'm disgusted as a Southington resident. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Kimberly Grabowski. Hi, my name is Kimberly Grabowski. I reside at 47 Bel Air Drive in Plainville, Connecticut. Um, I did not re realize it was going to be like this. I thought it was going to be a whole bunch of people and that I was showing up to support the problem of Clavanta and the noise. And now I'm here realizing not enough people are standing up. They're, they're talking online about it. There are so many people out there. Now I realize I have to be part of this part of getting it to go forward because because people like she said didn't realize that this noise was coming from there now we're at the realization because years ago it, this has been going on a long time but it was once in a while that i heard it i'm 4.7 miles away i live across in plainville right over the plainville line right off of camp street 
And it is just, this winter has been insane. Not, not how loud it is. It's like, you can absolutely hear it. You can open windows and hear it now. A couple of years ago, I'd be like opening the windows going, wait, wait a minute. Do I hear it? Or don't I hear it? So the extremity of it has gone over the top. I have an autistic daughter and she's complaining that she wakes up in the middle of the night and she doesn't say anything about the noise, but I'm just documenting that she wakes up in the middle of the night. She has a hard time getting back to sleep. So I'm just wondering what has changed. Like nothing's changed in our, our thing is that could it be that? So I'm very concerned about it. Um, and it's just getting worse and worse. It, I can't be in the top level in my house. A lot of times I'll go sleep on the couch if I wake up and I hear it because she, like the lady said, it is just so Woo, woo. it just keeps going at you and it doesn't stop it's like your husband's snoring and you can at least tell him to roll over but you can't tell them to roll over that's how how annoying it is and it's just to the point where you can't function and it's 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 upsetting my quality of life and my family's quality of life and now that i see that not a lot of people are here and i realize i have to step it up and i have to be the person like she is and, and really go and do these things so we do appreciate you. that thank you kimberly Christina Stafford. I did do everything that they say. <laughs> Christina Stafford, 32 Hemingway Street, Plainville, um, by Norton Park, um, 3.4 miles. Um, I dragged my friend Kim because I uh, we're all in the Facebook group. Yep. Um, there's a ton of people on there really thought that we were going to be part of a group, was not expecting this, but here we are to do our part. It is so annoying and it's an environmental issue. My dog who doesn't bark at anything except somebody knocking on my door or the garage door going up and down. And for the longest time, I kept complaining, what the heck? Why does it sound like my garage door is going up and down, up and down? And she's barking like a, you know, lunatic and it's very annoying you can't sleep it can happen in the middle of the night she pops up goes running thinking somebody's coming in the house and it's the event to plant um i know i did every single thing they say i know there's a time frame here but i just want to do my part and say please do something we do appreciate that um i don't think there's anybody else here to speak on covanta am i correct anybody on Zoom, Mark P, or I think Rory Gio is probably not going to speak. Okay, let me just change up a little bit. Not always, um, this isn't part of our normal meeting agenda, but uh, Marco Palmieri is here. So I'm going to ask him to come up. Uh, just, you know, for the record, I will state that we have heard the complaints over time. Um, and I just want to make one thing clear. The city does have ordinances on decibel levels and sound. We've sent our police out there. This is not a sound, typical sound thing. Marco's going to be more of an expert on this than me, but it's infrasonics, something that I will just say from my standpoint in dealing directly with Covanta, we, we don't have a city kind of catchment for this. Uh, we understand and hear you, uh, but we have spoken with Covanta. Covanta did put out that summary statement saying that they realized that in some of their changes, they they have uh, something that they are dealing with and they are willing to spend time and energy and effort to it. And the only thing I can tell you from my perspective is that it's a very intricate thing. Uh, we've actually heard reports recently that this has gone away for a while. It's come back. Uh, they're working on it, but it's, it's a highly sensitive area. And Marco from the Bristol Burlington Health Department is is the one who is has been really mainly dealing with this and I'm going to let him speak and I know you asked some questions he might be able to answer them here but while we're here we figure we'll take it on Marco I appreciate it mayor um and members of the city council and of course those who are complaining um Marco Palmieri director of health for the Bristol Burlington Health District I'm facing the city council, but I'm really addressing you folks. And I really, truly appreciate you coming up here. And many of you I've communicated with via email or you've contacted my staff. But it's important to understand that we are a governmental public health agency. We are tasked with the responsibility to assure all residents, whether it's in Bristol, Burlington, or Plainville, Southington, wherever they are that they have the highest quality of life. Trust me, this is my career. This is my passion. 
I love my job and I would never let citizens or the mayor or the city council or the town of Burlington down. I truly am taking this seriously. But you have to understand, like any investigation, whether it's police, fire or whatever, we need to do our job when we need to do it impartially with the highest level of accuracy and integrity. And we have reached out to academia, the um, professors who are um, uh, nationally renowned experts in this phenomenon. And I call it a phenomenon because I asked four or five different experts and no one really has a name for it. Some people used to call it infrasonics. And now we're getting a little bit more information that it's not really an infrasonic frequency. It's a little bit of a higher frequency. So we really can't use the term infrasonic. I've asked just the other day, we were traveling around uh, Bristol, uh, Plainville, and Southington, going to all these different sites. And I asked a gentleman who was an uh, acoustical engineer, what should I call it? And he said, I do not know. He's like, we don't know yet because calling things in our world is based on the frequency. And we have to measure that frequency over time to have a true depiction, just as uh, the Mayor Caggiano indicated, and just like many of you have indicated. Some days you don't hear it. Some days you do. Right. Yep, I, I have to ask, sorry for, right. we have to have a- Right, so it's- Let him talk, let him talk. So I need to do a study over time so I can get the days in which they're not operating at high capacity, which are days in which some of you may not be hearing it, to make sure that we capture every single variable. We are doing our due diligence and I may not be as quick to, um, you know, describe what we're doing, but it's because we don't want to describe what we're doing. We are in the middle of an investigation and we do our job. We investigate in um, dozens of complaints every single week and we conclude our investigation and then we present our findings. That's how the scientific world does it. So I, I am not trying to sound like I'm not listening or hearing you. I do. And I am taking this as serious as I possibly can. But you have to trust that this is a, as uh, the mayor indicated, a unique situation that requires high level um, uh, equipment and expertise and measurements that neither us nor the state nor other agencies can do. So we are reaching out to experts. I have a secondary expert as a consultant to assure that our consultant is doing what they're, they're supposed to be doing. We are not leaving any rock unturned, but just let me do my job. And I can't give you a timeline. There is some information that we have that we're looking to a close resolution, but I'm not gonna give you a timeline because it's not fair, because I have no guarantee that that timeline is gonna be a solid timeline. But I can't be any more sincere other than I am doing the best I can. And, and Marco, I, I'm, sure. we, we can't have, we can't conduct this in the meeting, I'm right. sorry. So what I am gonna ask is Marco has been very responsive. Uh, I'm gonna give out his phone number too. 584-7682 is the Bristol Burlington Health Department phone number. From what we have gotten from citizens, people that have called the office, he will follow up with you. And, and in part of his study, he is looking for, in a sense, volunteers to come and uh, determine the infrasonics, the vibrations, and this isn't really a noise thing. So, but we we can do that. And I appreciate you all coming and testifying. We have to, you know, go forward with our meeting here. And thank you, Marco, for staying and being a resource. I think you know, here is the, the best resource we can give you at this point. So thank you all. I appreciate that. I think we have one more public participant, and that's Mike Arasenko. Before I begin, I got a little gift for you guys. Wait, is, is that microphone still on? Still green? Okay, for the record, Mike Arasenko, 40 Palmer Place here in the great city of Bristol. 
Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. I'm here tonight to address a very disturbing issue at hand. As we all know, last month was Black History Month, a celebration of remembering important people and events in the history of the African-American community. The former mayor of our city decided to celebrate it by promoting hate and posting utterly distasteful and divisive memes on his Facebook page. I am sure that you will see a consistent theme in his posts. To mock the murder of an unarmed black man who is begging for his life and calling for his mother is the ugliest type of hate. This one act spurred a revolution of reaction in May of 2020 and was felt around the world, impacting race relations, community relations, and more. I hope we all can agree that these posts are ugly and do not reflect well on the values of Bristol as an all-heart city. In light of these posts, I feel it was in the best interest of the city of Bristol to remove the picture of former mayor Cockane. Someone with that type of mentality and views should not be acknowledged on the walls of council chambers. No offense, Mr. Mayor, I, I don't wanna hear that I'm a social libertarian on this issue. As a member of the Libertarian Party of Connecticut, I'm telling you, libertarians are against hate and bigotry like most normal people. This is not a free speech issue we're talking about. This is government speech, a whole different topic. Mr. Mayor, I've heard you say over and over again that hate has no place in our all heart city. Let's all agree for once, it's in the best interest for the city to not honor individuals with that type of mindset. I'm asking you bring forward a motion to condemn this disgraceful behavior and hate mongering from someone who once held the seat that you are currently holding and remove hate from our city hall. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Um, just one quick statement here for for the record, uh, and I had to look it up the date uh, on 5-9-23, this city council, after we were elected, uh, went through a charter revision commission, and we did uh, change the charter so that we could remove not only elected officials, but also appointed officials for malfeasance, and it, it could be things like this, it has to go through proper procedures. Um, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm not sure that we have the authority to go backwards because I think the intent of that was to, you know, handle local issues. But I, I appreciate what you're saying and I appreciate you coming to city council tonight. All right. I don't think we have any other um, public participation. Nobody else on Zoom added. One last call. Okay. We will move on to our consent agenda, I believe. Nope. Sorry. Announcements first. I'm jumping ahead. We'll start on my right. Uh, Eric, go ahead. Uh, back by popular demand, the Electronics Recycling Day. It's going to be April 27th from 9 to 12 at Bristol Eastern High School. Also, there will be a community cleanup April 20th, 830 to 12. Um, for multiple locations around the city, uh, details for both events can be found at the Public Works uh, website. Right, uh, bridge replacement for Drome Avenue between Sturbridge and Coolidge will begin uh, in April, so just be aware and plan ahead for alternate routes. Uh, for more information, uh, more information can be again found at Department of Public Works website. And that is it. Thank you, Eric. Sue? Uh, thank you. Uh, real quick, we have a prescription take back day on Saturday, April 27th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Walgreens at 525 Farmington Avenue. And also, it's a little bit down the road, but I just want to um, put it out there now. The Greater Bristol Exchange Club is hosting Honoring Heroes um, at the Aqua Turf on Thursday, June 27th. And this event um, is being held from 6 to 10. This year's officers that um, they are honoring are Officer Timothy Hall, Officer Christopher Bord Bordner, and Officer Jason DaCosta. There are also two police cadets that are also being honored. And I am sure in light of tonight's announcement, there might be um, a bit of an honor also for Chief Gould. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there to everyone. You can go on to the Bristol Exchange Club's uh, website and get more information about tickets. And one last thing, don't forget the Shamrock Road Race is this Saturday on March 16th. Very good. Thank you. Sebastian. 
Thank you, Mr. Mary. I want to just personally thank Chief Gould for his many decades of service here, really. I think we're all forever indebted to, to his service to the city, and we're all, we're all going to miss him very much. So uh, thank you to Chief Gould. Um, I wanted to point out that last month was the um, the Friends of the Bristol Library's annual book sale. They had their uh, their greatest sale ever. Uh, they they raised over $10,000, the Friends of the Library did last, last month. So thanks for everyone that came out. It was a great sale. Uh, they raise a lot of money for the friends who do a ton for the library. So we're hoping to beat that again next year. But thanks to the the public and the the friends of the library that came out to support the friends there. Thank you. Cheryl. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to start with highlighting the next three events that will be at Downtown Live at the Rockwell Theater. On March 30th, we have the Magic School Bus. This is a family-friendly event. It's great for children. It starts at 3 p.m., Children under 10 are only $20 and adults are 30. On April 20th, we're going to be swinging in the seats to the Drifters. This fantastic show kicks off at 7 o'clock. Tickets are still available, but they are going fast and they are $40. And then on May 4th, May the 4th be with you. This is practically an all-day event. It's from 3 to 9. There's going to be a podcast, autographs, costumes, a movie, you're just not going to want to miss it. This is the place to be downtown live on May 4th. Where else would you go? Especially if you're a Star Wars fan. Um, but if you don't like theaters, you can go fishing because we have free fishing events coming up. And I just want to jot these dates out so they get in your calendars. One does require pre-registration. And that's the 73rd annual Perry J. Spinelli Fishing Derby. And this is brought um, to you by our, our Bristol Parks and Rec department and it will be at page pond from 7 a.m to 10 a.m there is pre-registration required if you go to the city's parks website or there you'll be able to register so please um don't miss that you didn't give us the date on that. i didn't okay saturday april 27th thanks um the very next day, if you oversleep on Saturday, you can go fishing at Rockwell Park. And this is a derby brought to you by uh, American Legion Post 209. You can register the day of the event. Registration is from 6.30 to 8. And the yeah. tournament's from 8 to 11. And then if you, again, miss that or you just are so enthralled with fishing, the, the Pine Lake Fishing Tournament is on May 11th and registration begins at 7 a.m. Again, the last two events do not have pre-registration. And just one more announcement I, I just wanna share from American Legion Post 209. Um, <clears throat> they have announced the date and time for the Forestville Memorial Day Parade, which will be Sunday, May 26th at 2 p.m. Um, with a rain date of Monday at the same time. If they are looking for family members who have lost a loved one during any war to be involved in this parade, to bring a picture, to march with that picture of your loved one, or if you need to have a ride, they'll provide rides. Um, they want to honor those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. So you want to reach out to the American Legion Post 209. They do have a Facebook page, a website, and if you still can't find them, reach out to me and I'll help connect you with them. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Andrew? I actually have photos of her with a lightsaber, so she actually is excited with me for me. I'm bringing it next meeting. <laughs> we got time. That's good. I brought visuals. The POW, the vets are doing a POW MIA um, monument down on the boulevard. So they are selling these. They have T-shirts, hats, sweatshirts, crew neck, and hoodie all being sold at the hardware store on Farmington Avenue. Um, they are being sold downstairs at the Veteran Strong Center, as well as you can order them directly from uh, Primo Press on their website directly. Um, it's time to register for kindergarten. If your children are going to be five before December 1st, they're eligible to register. You can find the forms on the public school's website. Um, if he's going to be fall uh, five in the fall of 24, there's also a waiver on the main page. If your child, if you feel your child is ready, you can sign him up at that point. Uh, registration is kind of important become with these children because we have the fire truck ride attached to them. It's been so successful that we had two last year. 
I happened to see the mayor at Stafford School. Where I had my kids. Um, and they will have, is it a police department again? Yeah, so police and fire. And fire, we're going to do one. Okay, so register your kids today. Another from the SRC is on June 29th, the Making Bristol Better in conjunction with United Way West Central. And Jennifer St. John, the PTO member from Hubble School, the event will be held from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Baines Field. There'll be game stations, vendors alike for all families to enjoy and spend a day outside with your children. The Vets Council has the Patriot State event coming up. It's 8, uh, April 15th at 6 p.m. Normally they hold a ceremony at uh, Man Ross Library, but this year young Maggie Wernicke is adding a buffet onto it. It'll be located at Luna's on King Street. The cost is $25 per person. Tickets can be purchased in advance by April 8th. Cash or check is accepted downstairs at the Veteran Strong Center or you can purchase online by going to the Vet Strong Center Facebook page and clicking their link. Uh, that's, uh, uh, the third annual Dinner on the Diamond will be held on May 11, from 5 to 8 at Muzzy Field. Last year was a great, amazing night. Um, it's their major fundraiser for their parks department. Um, things going on as far as summer uh, camps and things of that nature. Uh, the first dinner was unbearably hot. So when they moved it to May, it came out perfect. Um, you can buy tickets at bristolct.myrec.com. They're $125 for a single or $250 for a couple. That's it. Thank you. Cheryl, you forgot one, right? I did. Um, oh. It's back, the duck race. The Pequabic River duck race will be the first Sunday in May. Inflation has not hit these tickets. There's still $5 a ticket and grand prize is $1,000 and there are 45 prizes. This is brought to you by the Forestville Village Association. If anybody needs tickets, I have some in there at various places and businesses around town. I believe you have some in your office maybe or uh, you know, I know the Parks that. Department does. So please see me or check with um, City True Value. It's definitely selling them. May 5th. So you get Star Wars on the 4th, Ducks on the 5th. So thank you. Great. Um, by the way, I did buy ticket number one. So I had the honor of doing that. Number one ticket. never went. Never, ever, ever I went. Never seen and number one. one I, I asked that question when I bought it, but that's all right. Uh, it's a definitely a fun event. I'm glad we're bringing it back. By the way, May 5th, one other announcement I just thought of is the Barnes Nature Center um, um, uh, uh, Wallace Barnes, I couldn't think of it. Wallace Barnes Trail will have its grand opening uh, that that Sunday as well. So Cinco de Mayo is going to be a busy day. Jackie, do you have any announcements on Zoom? Margaritas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I I don't have any announcements, but I do wish to, uh, Chief Gould thank him for his service, and I wish him well. Thank you. All right, um, we'll move on to number five, which is the consent agenda. There's items A through H. Does anybody wish to withdraw anything from the consent agenda? Okay, hearing none, I will ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We're going to move on to number six, which is reports and committee reports. We'll start with 6A, which is a salary committee, and I'll turn it over to you, Cheryl. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, item 6A, um, I would like to make a motion to approve a $5,000 annual salary increase for the Emergency Management Director retroactive to January 1, 2024. So moved. No, you moved to second. second. Okay. Yep. Um, so a little information on this increase. The current salary for the director is $25,000, of which the city pays half. And the grant uh, that we receive from the emergency management um, performance grant pays the other half. This increase of $5,000 will bring the salary to $30,000. Those funds will completely come from the grant. There will be no additional cost to the city. Um, and first of all, if those funds aren't used, they will go back to the to the grant provider. So this would be one way to compensate our director who is out at every event. Our CERT team is extremely active in the community. I can't think of an event I don't see them at. And we're very fortunate to have such a group of volunteers and a very dedicated director. 
Um, if you were to compare salaries across the, the, the region, you'd find that this is modest. And so the salary committee voted unanimous, uh, unanimously to approve this increase. Yep. I, I will just add that um, this is a full-time job. Harley puts his heart and soul into this, has done a great job. And um, I, I think um, this is very appropriate. And uh, that's all I'll say at this point. Any other comments or questions? So just to clarify, um, so this 5000 is is 100% from grant money? Yes. Okay. Thank you. To the chair. Jackie, go ahead. Uh, yeah, is is that all the money that's left in in the grant, Cheryl? No, it's not. Um, there are some funds that are being set aside because of where we need to relocate the office for the um, director. You know, with the movement of uh, he's currently over in the court complex, uh -huh. um, and there are some changes in and things that have to happen over there. So there are some funds set aside for that. All right. Thank you. Good questions. Any other questions? I think we're ready to vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody, anybody opposed? The motion carries. Cheryl, you're next with 6B. Yes. Congratulations, six Harley. Well deserved, by the way. Motion 6B. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve a 2.5% salary increase and a 0.75% increase cost share increase for non-bargaining employees effective July 1, 2024. Second. Great. Cheryl, give us a little background on this. Um, yes. Last year, um, the salary committee spent uh, significant time looking at the cost of the non-bargaining group. Um, one of the things we did is we streamlined the number of steps that were involved and we brought um, the salaries in line to, you know, to avoid compression as supervisors and staff. Um, and one of the things we also did at that time is decide as a committee that future increases would mirror what the um, BPSA contract states. And that contract, those employers are getting the 2.5% increase July 1 and the cost share as well. This way, they don't fall way behind and their salaries are kept um, commiserate with, you know, area regional salaries. Great. Um, I'll just add there's there's now 14 non-bargaining members. We used to have 13, but the best coordinator got thrown into non-bargaining. It's about a $42,000 increase. I know, Jackie, you had asked that, so you're on Zoom. So I wanted to make sure we got that information to you. Uh, by the way, that increase, one thing I didn't ask here, and I don't think we have anybody to answer it, but the increase in the benefit pay gets offset a little bit by that too. So that's mirroring the other contracts. But This increase has also been in, included in the upcoming budget. Correct. Good. Very complete, I think. Jackie, do you have any other questions? I know you had one earlier, but I think that uh, answered it. Or not? Yes, that, that answered my question, Mayor. Thank you. Anybody else have, have any comments, questions? So to? This has already been worked into the budget. So why did it have to come to salary? Well, each year, non-bargaining doesn't have bargain. So we don't right. do salary increases every year. So kind of the agreement three years ago when BPSA was agreed is that we would follow that structure. So we have to formally do it every year. But in our budget process, this is already built into that budget process, much like the other contractual obligations that we have. This isn't a contractual obligation, but this fits in the greater realm of making sure that we're paying everybody, you know, equally across the board. Does that make sense? So it's it's built into the budget projection that we have right now. Until we approve the budget, there's nothing approved, but this is part of the process to make sure that they get- Through, through the chair, yeah. even if it's in the budget, it doesn't get, um, Council still has to approve the increase. It just because it's in the budget doesn't mean it ha automatically would happen. So could we vote yes tonight, and then could it be cut from the budget? Well, anything yeah. can happen with the budget. We're ongoing the budget process right now. So yeah, these are recommended. Um, although there might be a technicality no, here. I, I don't think. I, I, I'm not sure if we can. I don't think you can do this. It's in the no. budget. I mean, once we approve it as a council, yeah, you can't cut it. No. Yep. But this doesn't fall into the line of the others. It's a good question, actually. So, so my my concern is that we are in the year of no, and we are in the year of 
not knowing how this is going to work out over the next month and a half. And um, I'm just struggling with saying yes to $42,000. Yep. I will also just put it officially on record. A lot happens in the budget process. And I probably have had hundreds of meetings. I see Diane there. She's had hundreds more than me. What we've technically said no to across the board to be more specific and clear is new things added to the budget. So we are taking into account, you know, they call it a flat budget, you know, contractual uplifts, um, increases in salt, increases in electricity, increases in things like that. We have not touched any of those things yet in the budget process. Um, I'm hopeful that we can work this out. And our goal is to not, you know, try to go back and undo contractual agreements. That's they have a, There is no contractual agreement here. So we are making the contractual agreement with them now. Uh, you know, $42,000 is an increase, but that's no new personnel, nothing of that sort here. This is this is kind of customary, is there but I understand where you're talking. List of who these fourteen people are. We can get to that list, um, definitely. Um, I, I can tell you that my admin is one of them. Our our corporation counsel are also in this list. Right. Some of the hardest working guys in uh, in City Hall our, uh, that are sitting yeah. to your right. If that helps, but we can get the full list for you, and we can get that through Mark Penny. All right. Any other comments or questions? I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? One opposition. Sue noted for the record. Jackie, I didn't hear you, so I just want to make sure we're clear. Were you I a did yes? say aye. <laughs> Very good. Yep. I just wanted to make sure. Duly noted. Motion does carry. Thanks. All right. Um, we're going to move to 6C, which is you, Sue, on code enforcement. Okay. Get down. Let's see here. I'm going to set the stage a little bit first um, before I actually make this motion. Um, okay. Um, so this is a little confusing. This is something that we have been working on in code enforcement and with court counsel and with the different team members now for, for many months. Um, this specifically is the Uniform Relocation Assistance Act. This is very similar to and based off of the federal law URA, which is the Uniform Relocation Assistance, and we have our own state version. So basically what this says is it requires municipalities to provide um, advisory assistance and financial benefits to displaced individuals and or businesses. Um, and there's a few different categories, but we're looking at this due to code enforcement activities. So this is when a property, um, because of code enforcement activities, when a property is condemned, and now there is this need to relocate people or or to actually displace people. So um, when needed, this this kicks in. And this is a this is a state statute. This is an unfunded mandate, and this is something that we have to kind of comply with right now. Um, so. Just to kind of give you a little historical background on how it's happened up to this point in time. So if an event occurs, let's say a fire and um, a three family and, you know, two floors are, are displaced because as a result of the fire, our building official had to condemn the apartment. Um, number one is, you know, most people can call family members, can, you know, find some place else to stay, and they're very resilient. But there are times where people who are living in these apartments, um, you know, need a little bit of assistance and advice on how what they're what they're going to do and where they're going to be staying. And historically, that is our community services. So Aubrey would would get called out in some of these cases. Um, and she goes out and she offers assistance and um, tries to help them find, you know, housing during that period of time that they are displaced from their house. Um, so the problem is, is that 
there's there's been kind of a perfect storm over the last couple of years and community services struggles when they go out and they they need to help somebody find relocation because we have a housing crisis because our rental market there is no rental units available um Historically, you know, it would be if a, a, an apartment wasn't found for somebody on this temporary basis, um, you know, uh, Aubrey would help find a, a, a motel in the area. Um, due to this housing crisis, due to COVID, um, due to a lot of people not being able to find their own, there's not this, this, this areas where we're able to help people find relocation. So when we do help place somebody like in a motel, we've had a few cases over the last um, couple of years. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we're going on here, which is fine. I know. Maybe we could do this during, we get, we should get the motion on the floor, I think. And then we could probably okay. answer some questions that might be the best because All right, so first I, I don't want to double our effort here, but go ahead. So first I'd like to make a motion to um, waive the reading of the policy. And I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. All right. Okay. So with the motion for me. Motion. I hereby move that the city of Bristol adopt the amended relocation plan attached here to for code enforcement activity pursuant to the Connecticut general statute section 8-266 known as the Uniform Relocation Assistance Act. I further move that this plan be referred to the Parks, Recreation, Youth, and Community Services Department to be effective immediately and to the Board of Financing for informational purposes. So move. That's a second. Oh, sorry, second. You, that was her, her. Yep, that's right. We have it. And I, I think bottom line here is if you read in the summary of changes, you know, this is going to uh, allow $4,000 stipend to assist in, in that relocation for the for the individuals displaced. What other questions do we have? I know Sue gave you a lot of information. You guys have had a chance to look through this. Any comments or questions? Through the there? chair. Well, this, because um, I know uh, Youth and Community Services, they're over their budget already on displaced and, and, and finding relocation. Is this going to help with that part of is that going it? It will most definitely help going forward. Doesn't going help forward. with this year, but the okay. budget year it will. And you know, we were talking over. about in that meeting how that was going to, yep, we were going to. It's yeah, a big reason, quite honestly, bridge that. I have to look at this. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So to kind of summarize all my, 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 thank you for pulling me back in. I haven't had enough coffee yet today. Um, but the bottom line is the reason why we had to kind of adjust this policy and amend it is because we are all heart, but our biggest responsibility is to our taxpayer. And there's going to be um, a Connecticut Supreme Court case that is doing arguments at the end of this month and then a ruling pretty soon. We're expecting it around summertime. So right now, in order for us to be fair, consistent, and to be able to apply this unfunded mandate, we are capping it at a $4,000 um disbursement when needed for these displaced, uh, displaced people. And that's consistent around the state as well. Yep. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. I paused that time and heard you. Very good, Jackie. Um, all right. D is real estate committee. That's you as well, Sue. Hey. My motion is, I hereby move that the city council direct the purchasing agent to issue an RFP placing public notices and to notify abutting property owners of the city's intention to sell a portion of city-owned property known as MAP 30, lot R4-1, Prospect Street. The purchasing agent shall indicate that costs associated with selling this property be the responsibility of the purchaser. The city of Bristol shall not be responsible for any costs in the sale of this property. Second. Very good. Um, Sue, just tell us quickly where this property is. And I think we're pretty familiar with this, but just right. Um, this property runs along Prospect Street and extends back to the back of um, Funk and the Funk and Eagle building. So this little strip here, um, and there's a parcel of it that we have to keep because of right away uh, for Henry Street. 
and um, this parcel is looking to be acquired um, to kind of support uh, an economic development project with yep. the um, Funk and Eagle buildings. Exactly. I think you covered that well. What other questions do we have, if any? Andrew? Jackie? You good? No questions. questions? Andrew? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Um, any other, I, there's no other motions and uh, actually committee outcome, I think the, any other uh, committee reports that we want to talk about? Eric, I'll start with you and we'll come down the line. Or any other uh, liaison reports, whatever you have. Yeah, Board of Education um, approved their budget to be forwarded to the, or the hearing uh, for the Board of Finance. The BOE, the BOE uh, unanimously, uh, unanimously approved the sale of alcohol at Rockwell Theater during non-BOE functions. Uh, classroom space at the former Westwood School is to be returned to the city to expand the senior center. The Fair Rent Commission only had one case that was not mediated or continued. Uh, the case was resolved. So make it pretty easy for us. That was nice. I like that. Quick and succinct. Sue. Just a little bit more on code enforcement. Um, we are rocking and rolling. And um, we did our first, we did the first half of our first 2024 clean and lean um, on March 2nd. We are going back to do part two on um, March 16th. Uh, just a couple of quick numbers. In the month of February, we had um, 36 complaints, which was the same as what we had in January. Uh, they spent, our code enforcement team spent um, a lot of time doing 192 follow-ups, which increased from the 115 the month before. And site visits, there were 107 up from 74 in January. Um, just really quick, building department uh, collected, well, tickets issued out of the building department for both January and February was in excess of $10,000. And for public works, it was 2304. Thank you, Sebastian. Sure, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, from the Firehouse Building Three Commission, just an update on the, the progress there with that project. Uh, some required infiltration testing is gonna be occurring on site. Um, in two days, actually, on March 14th. And then the project will go for land use later this month, which I believe is planning. Um, from the Cemetery Commission, uh, an update on the Eagle on the top of the uh, the monument there at West Cemetery. It should be completed next month. And uh, we did get some photos here from our, our contractor. I'll, I'll share that online also with a another Eagle from atop the P.T. Barnum Museum, I think, in Bridgeport. So he's got two Eagles that he's working on there. And uh, installation should uh, take place in June. We're also working on a couple of options to help restore the the rest of the monument there. We're optimistic about a couple avenues there to help with funding and uh, try and, and restore the rest of the monument to match the eagle. Yep. Can, can I ask you a question? I'm going to put you on the spot. Sure. What are the ideas for funding? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have some some nonprofit ideas that we're looking for. Um, we know the situation with the city right now, so uh, we have not fully pursued those as of yet. Yep. We did just get that update last night uh, as far as- You the, were very good. You forwarded it right to me, so I'm not surprised, but yeah. Um, so yeah, we're we're looking we're looking for some other, some options that, uh, that could help us out there for the rest of the monument. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Cheryl. Yes, hi. Um, I just wanted to share that the Spring Street Paving uh, Program will begin the end of this mar um, month, March 25th, is the anticipated kickoff date. If you want to know if your street's on this, the list will be published on the Public Works um, Facebook page and their um, web page. Um, some of the roads, we've got you know, Trelly, Wanda, and so forth, but some of the streets that had utility work earlier this year, such as Kenny, are also included on this list. So there's um, a great number of streets. So if your street's on here, you might want to buy a mega million ticket, ticket you know, for tonight because um, you're winning. Um, also, I just want to share that um, the Animal Control Facility um, Task Force or Committee has met and we interviewed three architects uh, recently. We'll be discussing again at our next meeting uh, the outcome of those interviews and hopefully choosing an architect to lead us um, to design the new facility. 
Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, update. I, I just have one from the Parks Department and slash Veterans Council. We are working on a police roundup problem. Before I go any in more in depth, um, there's a couple of options that we're looking at here. Trying to have it so that you can walk through and enjoy these monuments. We have a brand new QR code on each one of those monuments, but to get there, you kind of got to be a ballerina. So kind of hoping that we can get this. Yep. Yeah, and technically through the park board, it was tabled to the next park yeah. board meeting. Uh, I, I believe we'll have our reports from DEEP and other wildlife management agencies that do call this a public nuisance, and they are making the recommendations to the park board. So anybody that's interested, come to the next park board meeting uh, a week from Wednesday. The chairman will be attending with us at yeah. the parks. Exactly. Um, I know the Vets Council brought this forward. Yeah. We yeah. want to make sure we honor that request. Can Very good. Quickly thank a couple of people uh, or, or a welcome, I should say. The, I don't want to butcher her name. Amaris Estrada is our new superintendent assistant in the Parks and Rec Department, um, as well as Raylan Andrews is promoted to aquatic supervisor. She started with us in 2011 as a lifeguard and has earned many titles while she's been with us, including head lifeguard, most recently as aquatics director. So I want to say welcome to her. Um, and thank you to Neil Sopranovich yesterday for the World War II event. Um, it was quite moving, and I, the mayor and I were both there, and ended up being a wonderful event. So thank you to all of them, and welcome to the girls. And if you haven't seen the uh, paintings that Don Scott does, uh, Joe Caminiti, who is our Iwo Jimo survivor, has donated that to the library, so it's permanently on display at the library. It is spectacular. And Joe will be 100 this year on October 13th. So uh, he is as dry as could be. He's, uh, it's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. It was, it was 300 years of veterans yeah. in that room. Yeah. We had two Bristol veterans there that were 97, 98, and Joe's going to be 100. Be 100. So. Yeah. All right. So anything else, Andrew? I just want to say thank you and welcome. Jackie, do you have anything you'd like to report? I don't have any committee reports, but I just wanted to say I'm sorry I missed that veterans event. I really wanted to be there. And Andrew, welcome back. Thank you. All right. Did we miss anything? We will move on to number seven, which is old business. I'm not aware of any old business. Does anybody have any old business? How about new business? Hearing no new business, I'll ask uh, Erica to let us know the resignations for this month. We have two. Michael Mazzarelli resigned from the Economic Community and Development Commission, and Greg Klimek resigned from Bristol Housing Authority. Thank you very much. To the chair, I'd like to make a motion to put um, those names, the report on file, and to send thank you notes to both the individuals for their service. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody? Sorry about that, Jackie. Anybody opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. All right. So um, these were expected, actually, which is good. So our first appointment is for the Bristol Housing Authority. We are going to replace Greg Klimek with uh, David Hartley. Um, mm -hmm. That term will expire in 1226. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. The Commission on Aging, we are going to reappoint both Christine Lee and George Irving, and they both have expiration dates of 327. Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we're good with the cemetery ones. Yes. They're good. I just want to double check. Uh, we are going to reappoint Thomas Laporte. Uh, his term will now expire in 327. So, uh, so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? I'm going to jump down to the economic and development. Uh, we are going to replace Michael Mazzarelli with Louise Provenzano. That term expires in 1225. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. And then just a Robert's rule thing. These are announcements, correct? Uh, because they were appointed by the individual. So we're just announcing these. But our Board of Ethics, we had a series of uh, members that um, 
terms had lapsed, so we need to reappoint. And uh, these are individual appointments by each of the council members and myself. So the first reappointment is for Roger Chason. He, he is attributed to Cheryl Tebow by the records. That's the way it is. I know we had some uh, discussion. It gets very complicated because we inherited members from the previous council. And when we had a complete turnover, some of that a, a pro apportionment might not be exactly what we thought or, or want, but we did double check the meeting minutes from earlier. So this is Cheryl's appointment. Um, Sebastian has an appointment and he's going to reappoint Byron Pierce. Uh, I had an appointment. This was the best appointment I've ever had. Jeffrey Crook. His last name really was Crook uh, for the ethics board. Uh, he unfortunately can't serve any longer. So I am going to replace Jeffrey Crook with Bryant Lishness. So that's my appointment. And then um, uh, Sue Tyler's replacement for Kenneth Zatarski will be Chris O'Donnell. So those are our ethics commission's individual appointments. We have it all straight now. So remember who you have and uh, we'll move forward from there. And those are all that I have. No, uh, no. So anybody who had a previous, Andrew had a good question. Anybody who had a previous appointment, these are three-year appointments, but she was last year. So she won't come up for a little while. So we are complete and full on the ethics uh, commission. And I hope they never get called. Um, all righty. I don't have any other appointments. We move on to number 11, which is our contracts. So can I have somebody read the motion? <clears throat> Make a motion to award contract 2C24-070 roadway reconstruction slash drainage and miscellaneous work to Tobacco and Sun Builders Incorporated in the amount of $1,444,250 and to authorize the mayor or acting mayor to execute any and all documents necessary to effectuate said contract. Second. Great. Ray stuck in for a long time here. Does anybody have any questions or comments on this? This one's pretty straightforward. Ray, I'm sure this is going to be for you. Weren't they put on the no-no list already? They couldn't? No, tobacco wasn't? Okay. Nope. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have a question or comment on this one? No-no list. I'll, we'll go, Sue, you have something? I'm just, my number 11 is different. <laughs> right? Oh. Oh, okay. I'm on, on the right one, I think, right? All right. Yeah, yeah, yep. yep. That's right. Let's we're ready to vote on this, I think. Any other yes. questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? That motion carries. All right. Now we're gonna move on to number 12. And number 12 is somewhat a little bit interrelated with 13. We're getting there, Stella. Um <laughs> All right. So this is uh, a motion and I'll read it and then we can have somebody make the motion to place on file the following approved motion made by the Bristol Planning Commission to release the following declaration of restrictions adopted by the City Council on October 30th, 1961 and record on the Bristol's Land Records Volume 438, page 513 for 135 Cross Street, Assessors Map 3, Lot 15. Restriction number two, the use of the premises shall be restricted to industrial manufacturing purpose. And the restriction number seven, the right of reversion to the title of the city of Bristol at the original purchase price under certain events. The planning commission finds that the restrictions are no longer needed due to changes in the land use approval process and the greater level of scrutiny that development applications now receive. So right. moved. So moved. Second. All right. And, um, Old uh, business park rules no longer apply here. We have a, a new entity that's coming in. So the planning commission took care of that, but we have to accept it. Uh, any other questions on this one or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? That motion carries. All right, number 13. Stella, I'm actually going to ask you to come up now. And traditionally, we've allowed our cannabis establishments to come up and tell a little bit of their story. And then we have actually two motions that we have to put forward here. But we'll let Stella talk about her business and um, what they plan to do at that said location. 35 Cross Street. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members, for letting me uh, say a little bit here. Um, I'm hoping to give a little primer on Buds as a company in our current operations, um, which we hope to replicate here in Bristol. Um, we do run three retail dispensaries in Massachusetts, um, but we opened the doors to our manufacturing facility there in 2022. 
The majority of our business at that facility is as a B2B packager. We take in bulk product and turn it into cannabis pre-rolls and packaged cannabis. Um, we compliantly label that product use, utilizing uh, robotics and automation. When cultivators choose us to process their cannabis, they can focus on cultivation and allow us to focus on the nuances of compliant cannabis packaging and labeling. We're the first facility of our type in Massachusetts and our robots now operate for two shifts a day, five days a week. We employ dozens of people at a variety of levels and departments, including machine operators, engineers, inventory, you guys are so sweet. <laughs> Talk right into that microphone so the kids are recording it, thanks. Logistics and transportation personnel, purchasers, department managers, and many more. There are a variety of ways to start a career in a facility like ours. And the barriers to upward mobility don't exist in cannabis in the same way that they do in other businesses and other industries. There are tons of opportunities for advancement for a dedicated and passionate entry-level employee who's never been in cannabis or manufacturing, but hopes to develop themselves and to make a living wage. In Connecticut, we were awarded a provisional product packaging license as a result of the general lottery in 2021. And as we collected our licensing package, the goalpost shifted a bit at the state level. When we felt we were ready to apply for local approval in Bristol last fall, we were assured by our council that as a general applicant, we had all the materials that we could share with Bristol. We then found out that we were required to have the social equity plan originally thought to apply to social equity licensees only. The process behind collecting the information required for this plan, connecting with local nonprofits that serve what the state refers to as disproportionately impacted areas, promising those nonprofits a certain level of support from BUDS, submitting the plan and then making any changes required by the council is not a straightforward process, but I'm lucky to have connected with groups that are responsible for so much good work in Bristol, and BUDS has an approved final plan that we're really proud of. Working with the city of Bristol for the last eight months as someone who works closely with half a dozen municipalities has been an unexpected pleasure. Your personnel are brilliant, transparent, and extremely professional. Your city files are organized. People pick up the phone and answer my emails. Um, Mayor Caggiano, um, city planner Robert Flanagan, Tom Conlin, um, and Justin Malley have thoughtfully explained zoning and legal concepts that I did not understand without once disparaging me. <laughs> And I'm really grateful uh, to be here today. Thanks. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks. Uh, we'll go ahead and do questions now while she's there. Does anybody have any questions? We have two separate motions here, the way I understand it. So we accepted to place on file the Planning Commission restrictions, but we're also going to have to relieve them of that in one of the motions. And then by our ordinance, we're also going to have to um, undertake the approval of ordinance under Section 13.126. But... While Stella's here, she was very patient. That's why I brought her up first. She waited a long time. Anybody have any questions about the two motions that will be coming forward? How many people will uh, this facility employ? Uh, we anticipate about two dozen. We have about 24 to 26 right now in Lakeville, Massachusetts, and we hope to replicate that size. And will that be a first shift and a second shift, as you said, the robots? Um, yes. Uh, it depends, of course, on some of the requirements on hours that we're allowed to be open. I think um, it might be eight to six in Bristol. Um, but yeah, we will comply with our um, allowable hours. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Other questions? Comments. Jackie, any questions or comments? We'll, we'll have an opportunity to debate some more when we get the motions too, but just while yeah, Stella's just here. Just one question. Um, when's the anticipated opening for the uh, business? Great question. There are a lot of moving parts. Um, our license does expire. Our provisional license expires in January of 25. So hopefully before that, before that date. Thank you. Okay. And for the record, I will state that they had originally, and you'll see some of these stamps, that their package was given to us in November. Uh, and that's where the social equity approval kind of came about and was a, a new thing for them. It's something that we're pretty familiar with, but they had to go back to the drawing board. Uh, I'm glad we're coming in under the wire. And we maybe got through that quicker than we expected, which is good. Sue, so, uh, I mean, sorry, Cheryl. Yeah. Um on our uh, retail stores, they're not allowed to advertise or have, um, you know, symbols or signs. I take it that's true for your your building as well. It will be nondescript. Exactly. People won't really know what goes on in there. Yep, no public uh, entry at all. Yeah. 
Okay. It's packaged. Or signage. Exactly. Okay. Um, completely limited access. Thank you. And from what I understand, very strict state regulations on security, security cameras, things of that sort. So uh, they'll, they'll have to go through that process still with the state. Just for one more. I just want to make sure, and, and I, I know it's business to business and it's just packaging, right? Okay. So it's not a retail, it's... No, yeah, Correct. no public facing, um, no public facing entrances yeah, at all. In fact, we're required to register visitors with the twenty four hours in advance of their visit. Perfect. I just wanted to bring that out. So, Eric, there's a testing location right for you. Don't worry. To the chair, can so can you synopsize your social equity plan for us? Sure. Yeah, we um have two main goals. The first, we're working with um a group called Petals and Stem. Um, the founder of Petals and Stem, Hannah Butler. Uh, provides a mentorship program for young women of color. So we are doing three scholarships that we are offering to um, young women in Bristol. And we're kind of partnering with the Boys and Girls Club here um, to sort of do some advertising for that and find them the right candidates for those scholarships. Um, and we hope to help them uh, support their events throughout the year um, and any other you know um, little needs that they might have. And then the second goal uh, is supporting homelessness in Bristol. Uh, we're working with Brian's Angels and St. Vincent de Paul to do that, uh, both with volunteer hours and fiscal donations. Are those higher education? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yep. So she focuses largely on grade nine through uh, professional degree, through two professional degrees. Um, so they've got mentors that um, have been through med school, have been through various science degrees and can help guide younger women who are seeking those same degrees to help get them through this process. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. So we have two motions. Hang out there. I don't know if I have other questions, but you did a very good job. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, can somebody read the first motion? It's in, on CC 13. It's the, sure. the first page. Go ahead, Cheryl. I make a motion to relieve 135 Cross Street, also known as Lot 15, Assessor's Map 3, from restriction number 2 of the Declaration of Restrictions recorded in Volume 438, page 513 of the City of Bristol Land Records, and from any rights of reversion as found in paragraphs 7 and 9 of said declaration, that Corporation Council's office prepare a partial release or recording on the land records and to give effect to this action and authorize the mayor or acting mayor to execute said partial release. Second, somebody? Second. Great. Questions or comments on this? Remember, this is the follow through from 12. Um, good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? That motion carries. And Sebastian, I'm trying to pull up the ordinance one, which I'll let you do. Um, I had it here. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Read that one for me, Sebastian. I move that the city of Bristol approve the cannabis establishment Bud's Goods of CT to locate a cannabis packaging facility at 135 Cross Street pursuant to Bristol City Code of Ordinance. Section 13-126. Second. Great. And I think Stella did a great job explaining it, but one last chance for questions here or comments. Uh, just as a reminder, too, we don't have any restriction on the number of manufacturers, pa packagers, things of that sort. So there's none of that happening here. You had a good question on that, Eric. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Is there anybody opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you for your patience, Stella. Congrats. Good luck. Yeah, looking forward to to getting to Bristol here. You want to be in the testing room with Eric? No, this is all <laughs> packaging. It's all very well regulated. All right. Um, I don't think there's any other matter. We have no executive session tonight to come before us. Does anybody have anything else that we missed? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Oh,